Check. Check one, two. Check. Check. Check one, two.
Good afternoon. So I want to get I want to get started as quickly as we can here and give our guests the hour that they deserve. Um, before I do that, a quick announcement on behalf of the school is on the screen. There's the Nutrition Data Summit taking place in the fall. Very much uh, coming from interest from students. So you can find information on this, and I expect that you're probably already getting information on it. But something you should be looking forward to in the fall. So with that, um, I know most of the people here. I'm Tim Griffin of the AFE program. Uh, you can't imagine my excitement about having our guests here today uh, from the University of Nebraska. As many of you, especially the AFE students know, I went to the University of Nebraska for my first two degrees, grew up in the Midwest, and I've been talking to RFI over the last year. And this is like one thing we came up with last April in about the first 20 minutes of our conversation was we need to, we need to get together and very much with uh, the idea that we should be having conversations about um, positive opportunities that link rural and urban areas both in the United States and outside of the United States. And the, our conversation over the last day and a half has been very much in that vein. So. Um, I want to, we have two presenters today. We have Chuck Schroeder, and I'll let Chuck introduce his role. And we have Connie reimers hild and I'll let Connie introduce her role. And I ask them, as usual, to keep it to about 45 minutes, and then we will have some time for discussion. Um, and students in the room probably already know that if you've seen information that there is a lunch afterwards upstairs. Uh, they've met with some undergrad and graduate students already, but it's another opportunity to do so. So I don't know who, or Chuck, are you first? Yes. So I'm going to turn it over to Chuck and let's welcome our guests. Whoa, what am I doing? Sorry. This always happens. <laughs> okay. I figured there was another <laughs> another presentation there somewhere, right? Yeah. Well, listen, uh, good afternoon. I can't tell you what a delight it has been and then for do we just do Connie and me, that one? as well as uh, uh, two colleagues, uh, like Teresa Klein and Caitlin Ideas, uh, who are also here from the Rural Futures Institute at the University of Nebraska, to spend uh, the last couple of days here at Tufts and at Harvard. Uh, we've been here long enough, I see some familiar faces, so it's already feeling kind of like home. But uh, I'm the founding executive director of the Rural Futures Institute, which was a big idea founded at the University of Nebraska around the notion of shouldn't there be some place on the planet where we bring together the broadest array of resources harnessing the resources of the University of Nebraska and its partners, and that circle of partners has been expanding here over the last couple of days, where we could perhaps wrestle with the broadest array of challenges to rural people and places. So, our big, hairy, audacious goal at the Rural Futures Institute is a thriving, high-touch, high-tech future for rural. We're very serious about both sides of that equation. We've spent a lot of time over the years thinking about the high-tech side and the importance of connectivity, and we'll talk a little more about that. Enormously important, but you know what? It is still all about people. It is still all about people and relationships, human creativity, human connections to one another locally and broadly in order to achieve that high-touch, high-tech future where we believe communities can best thrive. So, if you are followers of Simon Sinek, you know that uh, he says it's not just the what you do that's important, it's the why that creates the foundation for the things that you're going to hear more about through uh, my presentation and Connie. So I want to walk through a few of our core beliefs at the Institute. And by the way, as I shared with a group this morning, these are not just theoretical, oh, wouldn't that be nice, things that you'd like to put on your 
resume to say, yes, these things and faith, hope, and love are what I'm all about. No. What we're going to share with you, these beliefs are based in our observations of success in rural communities. So number one, and most fundamental, we believe in people's capacity to shape their own future. You can read all the mega trends that you want about how rural communities can't be successful, they're this or that, they're too far from the interstate, they're too small population, all of that's great, except when you get down to individuals who are making decisions about what's going to happen to them, their families, and their communities, and by the way, they're making a difference. We believe that communities are not just localities, but also networked groups of individuals working together toward a common goal and shared purpose. It's important to understand because as we think about communities, indeed, we think about Oregon, Nebraska, and Seward, and places like that, but we also think about communities of practice, folks that are working in and around the rural realm. And by the way, uh, we feel that we added to that community of practice this morning with some students that we met with, uh, the folks that we met with at Harvard Law a couple of days ago. Um, it is important that we think about connectivity and creativity involving communities not only of location but of practice. So this whole idea of creativity, we had the, had the notion come up this morning. That, well, what we hear, what we think about rural communities is there's a lack of creativity and that whole intellectual firepower. Well, unfortunately, it's just not true. Uh, Richard Ford, who's a, a fellow that I, I worked with a good bit when I was in Oklahoma, talks a bit about the creative class, which, by the way, is not confined to urban settings. But the important thing about creativity is that we think about, and this is such a critical issue for rural communities, it's not just about business development, it's not just about technology, but creativity combines science and technology, business management professions, art, design, entertainment. And in a small community, that has to happen. That's where the energy comes from, is when we cross those sectors, and it's where creativity happens. We believe that leaders, by the way, are known by their vision, their ideas, their energy, passion, and engagement in collective action. If you hear nothing else this afternoon, underline this notion of leadership. What we know about successful, thriving rural communities is it's not about population. It's not about how close they are to an interstate or an airport. It isn't about the mix of the, the local economy. It is always, always about leadership. It's about who's there, not where they are. And by the way, in today's world, leaders are no longer defined by title or by heritage. Uh, leadership in a rural community is no longer defined by the four oldest, fattest, whitest haired guys in town making all the decisions like they have for the last 40 years. It is defined by those folks in that community who have a vision, who say, here's, we're not okay with where we are. We think we know where we'd like to go as a community. And we have, by the way, a core group of us that want to move in that direction. Those are the leaders that we try to be in the business of empowering with information, with inspiration, with productivity in order to achieve their dreams. Entrepreneurs are individuals and communities that combine strategic foresight and grit to take action to reach their desired futures. Entrepreneurship is the key. And by the way, it's not strictly economic entrepreneurship. Yes, we're interested in small business development, startups, using the resources of both human and natural resources in a community to start new enterprises that are reflective of the assets that are there. And we're also talking about social entrepreneurship, rethinking what our community looks like, how we draw people into the circle of leadership in a community that weren't there before. And so we believe also that diverse and inclusive leadership is needed to propel communities forward. Again, we're seeing this happen. We're seeing a new generation of leaders in rural communities say, we can't just rely on the cosmos to drive change in our community. 
we're going to have to take purposeful action in order to draw new residents in our community who are otherwise being left out of the circle. We're going to invite them in. Uh, one of our, our good friends in West Point, Nebraska, who's uh, now well in his 70s, has been one of those change agents, said, we just say invite them to church. We don't care what church. Just invite them to come. Come to the church social. Come be a part of some conversation because once they're there once, you'll find them showing up at other events in the community. So this whole idea of drawing new people into the circle gets around to this idea of shared creativity because creativity, unlike land, labor, and capital, those things that we thought of as the key resources for economic development in the past, they could be depleted. Creativity, not so. Creativity builds on itself. Energy breeds energy. So we try to be in the business of encouraging those creative types to come into leadership roles in the community. We believe that our complex, complex future requires mutual respect, collaboration between rural and urban. One of the reasons, the principal reasons that we're here at Tufts is to connect rural and urban. And we've had so many fascinating experiences over the last two days, but we know that we need each other. The whole rural-urban divide is a myth that we would like to bust. So what we also know when we think about rural communities and connecting to urban communities, we know that creativity attracts creativity. Creative people attract other creative people. So the more we can make that connection, the more that we can bring creative people together, uh, the more success we're going to have in rural communities. So, I'm going to end my section of this going through six characteristics of a successful rural community. We had a, a study was commissioned a few years ago by Dr. Lindsay Hastings at the University of Nebraska who looked at some rural communities that had been successful in transferring leadership generation to generation. Her findings, we found, actually apply to virtually every successful rural community that we dealt with. Number one has to be leadership that matters. Again, leadership that's not just occupying the seat, that's not just so proud of being elected mayor, but are actually getting up every day and saying, okay, how can, what actions can I take to draw people into the circle, to encourage their creativity, to make my community better? Deliberate efforts to invite people into leadership roles who might not otherwise participate. We've touched on that. Willingness to invest in the community. We find rural communities that are really thriving today who are not sitting around waiting for the next big smokestack to come to town and create an economy. West Point, Nebraska, Connie's hometown. Wonderful community that has thrived now for generations. They have business after business after business on Main Street that were established by groups of one, two, three, six local investors who have said, you know, our community would be stronger if we had that business. I don't care if it's terribly profitable, I want to break even, but my business would be better if that business were here so they invest. Fear is not a barrier to taking steps toward a desired objective. Sounds like Adam, it's really a big deal. When we, when we talk to uh, folks in rural communities where they really have driven a renaissance, and we say, well, how did that happen? Uh, Hastings, Nebraska, their uh, downtown redevelopment leader said, five, four votes of the city council. We, did, we figured out the cavalry ain't a come, and we're going to have to take charge it was five, four votes of the city council. This was not Kumbaya or HKIM. Strong social networks. And this is not everybody in town being on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. It is people come out, sit down together, and say, what could we do as a community that would make this a better place? Those communities that are making it do this purposely. It isn't by accident. It isn't by accident. And finally, and most importantly, we've got t-shirts. If you want one, I'm sure we can get one to you. Hopeful vision backed by grit. Those communities that are making it have said, we're not okay with where we are. We believe that we can be better because I'm working and living around people who have hope. And by the way, we're willing to take risks. We're willing to kind of fight it out in our decision-making.
thinking, and we're going to see to it that this community is a better place than it's been. So at this point, I'm going to invite uh, my colleague, Dr. Connie Rambers Hill, who is the Associate Executive Director and Chief Futurist at RFI, to come talk to you. Great. Thank you, Chuck. OK, so this is kind of the reaction I get. Let's see when we get there. Um, when people hear <laughs> that I am the chief futurist, it goes one of two ways. Oh, that's really cool. Like, how can I become one of those? Or futuring, yeah, right. Like, what exactly is that? So I do want to explain a little bit about what that is and why this type of work is so critical to our mission at the Rural Futures Institute. Many times people think the future and futuring also use a strategic foresight. I use those two terms interchangeably. You start at point A and you move to the future like point B. So you're actually predicting the future, telling people what their future is going to be, sort of looking in that crystal ball and helping them understand that. But actually, it's not like that at all. Futuring is it's really a science. It's a discipline. Now, it's relatively new compared to some of the disciplines that are studied here at Tufts and other universities, like our university system in Nebraska. But as we all know, I mean, I think we're all at the point in our lives, we, we can sometimes see that the future looks a little more like this, right? We're at point A. But there are actually many plausible futures in our path, many different ways we could go, decisions that we could make, but also other things that are going to happen that we can't always predict. So strategic foresight and futuring are not an exact science. But it's really that science of looking forward, You're planning for, for the future. And it's the methodology, but that's really married up to the mindset. We now know that mindset's incredibly important to achieve outcomes. We have to believe things are possible. Just like many of the communities Chuck mentioned, if they believe their future is going to be one of opportunity and growth, then that's what's going to happen. But if they believe it's going to be desolate, that also will happen. They have to choose. They have to make those choices. And we want to help them with that. But it's also looking at the future and looking forward. What do we really want this to be? What do we really want to experience while we're here? What do we want our communities to experience? Uh, just like the community of Tufts. I think you know, with Tim hosting us here, it's been so fascinating and, and great to meet the students and the faculty and just you know, kind of feel the atmosphere, right? Feel the future as we're sitting here in these meetings and getting to meet with incredible people. It's recognized now as a core leadership competency. Why do you think that is? Now, I, I have spent years in the classroom, so I am going to call on people if I get desperate. So this, this, I do want this to be a bit interactive. Why do you think now is a time to infuse strategic foresight and futuring into leadership? What, what do we experience right now? What's happening? Say that a little louder. Absolutely. There's a lot of uncertainty, right? We can't just know everything about one thing anymore. It's about bringing people together and thoughts together and taking those systems approaches, much like you do here at the Friedman School. What else? Other thoughts? You look like you have a thought. And you're in the front row. Thank you. That's great. Because not everybody has it. Oh, good. Explain well, more. Right, right. So expand what you're thinking, though. Not everybody has it. Not everybody has it all the time. Um, it's not easy to look forward and, and see multiple plausible futures of the crime ahead of you and try to figure out a way to either choose which of those you think is most desirable and then how do you take a step to get there. Great. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, this isn't necessarily a strength for everybody, right? We don't naturally have this or possess this. Now, I didn't really always realize that I was a little bit of a futurist, even like when I was little. It was just something that, that sort of I was born with. It is one of my top strengths if you take a tool like the Gallup Strengths Finder. And for a long time, I always wondered why I was this person. Like I was literally like 10 years out here somewhere in my mind. Um, it, it's sort of like where science fiction eventually meets science fact. Yeah, I think that that's where, you know, and I, I'm going to borrow that from the Thor movies because I am a bit of <laughs> a science fiction junkie and nerd. 
Um, but, you know, it's, it's really having a different view of the world. So actually when I was in high school, now and this is, I'm not going to totally age myself, but this is a long time ago, just want you to know. It's been a while. I was actually, you know, and I grew up in West Point, Nebraska, for the most part, um, small town. And this was before the internet or Facebook or Twitter, but I could see where bottled water was going to be a really big thing. And I was like, okay, mom, dad, like, I just need you to know this. And of course they're looking at me like, who are you? <laughs> and what exactly are you trying to say? Well, you could see this growth. And then, you know, of course, about 10 years later, like, oh, Connie, we really should have listened to you on that one, right? And so it's not that I always make the best investment decisions or use that knowledge, but it's something where you can bring a lot of disparate phenomenon or data together and put it together in a very cohesive way to create those different alternatives and scenarios. Because we are seeing this pace of change at an increasingly rapid rate, right? So again, that future consists of many plausible outcomes. There's not just point A to point B. There's a lot that happens in between there. But also people have the capacity. I think this is very, very important. People have the capacity to influence those outcomes through their beliefs, their behaviors, and their mindsets. But there are also things that happen, right? In the world of futuring, we call these wild cards. Those things that you don't always foresee happening, the things that sort of strike you, and you're like, oh, wow, I totally didn't see that coming. So natural disasters we can think of as a wild card. You know, that can be a drought. It can be a tornado. It can be a hurricane. Things we can't always predict. We know that they're going to happen at some point. I mean, that's the likelihood. But we don't exactly know when or how big or how small. Health. You know, you can have just personally a health situation that you didn't see coming. Now, it might have been in the making for a while, but at the same time, you could be riding your bike, right? We know there's a lot of biking going on here. Riding your bike and have a major bike accident. That changes the outcome. Things like the stock market, um, different financial situations throughout the world have an influence and impact on what happens, those outcomes, right? You could even win the lottery. Now, you have to buy a ticket to play, right? We know that. But you could inherit a large sum of money, for example. So wild cards don't always have to be negative. They can also be very positive. But again, if I would have won the Mega Millions at 520 million, I probably wouldn't be here, Tim. I'm sorry, but my goal with that was to call in rich and just be done, right? So these types of things can happen. And again, that will influence those outcomes. It'll influence the trajectory or our path. But it's also mindset, right? So we have to keep that path Know where we want to go and keep working towards it, even against those odds, regardless of those wild cards, right? Everything that can be invented has been invented. And this was by Charles Duell, Commissioner of the U.S. Office of Patents, in 1899. Now, could you imagine if he could get in a time machine from 1899 and be transported here now, what he would think? I mean, what do you think his thoughts would be? I mean, I hear like little laughs and stuff, but seriously, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? To come from 1899 to the period in time that we're living in now. And let alone, I'd love to beam myself 100 years to the future sometimes to see what that really looks like, because we don't know. But has everything been invented? What do you believe? How many of you think yes? Like, I think it's all been invented and we're just kind of riffing off some of the stuff now. How many of you think there's a lot more to do in this space? Yay, I'm so glad. Good. Yes, and that's the mindset we need to have, right? We still have not just innovations in terms of technology to create. That will continue to happen. But when we talk about innovation in the future, we talk about new partnerships, much like the, the reason RFI is here at Tufts right now. You know, how can we bring new partnerships into this space? What new partnerships or programs can we create? It might be a technology solution, but it might not be. It might be a new collaboration. The key is that it has to get used somehow, right? We have to move from that creative space into the actual innovation of implementation and action. But we see, and this is actually old data from like a year ago, so this has increased exponentially. But we know the world is changing at an increasingly rapid rate. I mean, you think about it, um, again, I'll age myself a little bit, but when I first started listening to music, it was on an eight track. How many of you have ever even seen that? Yeah, okay, so I still have a few, yes. I was always hoping that would make a comeback, but I don't, I don't think that's happening. The records have. But you know, I just remember our eight-track player. And you would, you, you'd have to be really patient, because there wasn't a, a good way to really get to the next song. 
right? And then pretty soon you had the boom box, and that was awesome, because I'm like, yeah, portable music. It's like, this, it's like 20 pounds. I mean, this thing was huge, right? But those cassettes were really sturdy. I still have some. I once in a while run into one. Um, and then you move to the Walkman with the, the cassette, and pretty soon that was a DVD. Yeah, you know, so there was this, I, I think I have all these things in my house. It'd be kind of fun to just display them in a museum, I think, at some point, the progression of all this. But to, I would have never thought growing up or as a teenager in high school that someday I'd be able to use my phone for music. I didn't see that coming, right? And, and the think, in thinking about how that's disrupted things like the music industry, for example, and how they've had to change their business model. This is where so many industries are, including higher education right now. Because this isn't just coming from companies. Where is it coming from? Where is it coming from? All, a lot of this data, a lot of the information being produced. Why are we seeing such a rapid growth? Yes. Love it. Yes, thank you. Citizens, citizens, people, right? People have been empowered to create their own YouTube channels, to, to create whatever it is they can even dream up at this point. And this evolution will continue. I mean, we'll con continue to see technology expand at a rapid rate. I mean, many of you are, are working in this space. Um, and I think as, as institutions of higher education, I think this is really interesting for us to think about how our model changes as well. Okay, now I have to, I have to see what's going on over here in, in the second row. Okay, so what is the joke? What is the joke? No, honestly, what are you thinking? <laughs> right, right. But I, I, I think that's it, right? So we have Jill Watson, AI powered graduate assistant chatbot at the Georgia Institute of Technology, who's answering questions with 97% accuracy, right? Because Jill is able to take all those answers and keep building and building on that database, right? And she's always available. So it's, it's really thinking about what this looks like as we move forward. Now, the good news here is that um, we did host an executive for Microsoft last week, Shelly McKinley. She's their director of technology and corporate responsibility. And she said what they're really finding, and research will, will prove this out or, or bear this out, even in healthcare, is it's not just about accuracy. There's an element of humanity in here as well. And so what improves accuracy in many of these cases and especially in places like the medical industry, for example, is when things like artificial intelligence are married up with people. And, and those, the technology, that high tech and high touch come together in a very intentional way. Yeah, so I don't know. I feel like I could just do my job sometimes. I'd be like, just download that app on your phone and we're good to go, right? Other technologies that we see influencing the future of the world, and we heard about some of these this morning even. This is so great. You know, developing something like lab on a chip that can be printed with an inkjet printer. Anywhere in the world, you have an inkjet printer. And the reason this technology was developed was so more people would have access to healthcare. And so they could actually assess what their health was like using the chip. So you can actually spit on the chip, and it'll read information about you. You know, what's going on with your health? It can read that. And in a lot of ways, this was developed for developing countries. But of course, in our rural spaces, this type of technology is very important as well. Um, but think about it. You don't even have to be a trained lab technician to use this type of technology. And it can be printed for cents, literally just a few cents. At the same time, we see all this growth in technology and all these big investments in technology. We have a major demographic shift going on. Right, and this is where I think now rural has become kind of a, a hot topic lately. In 1910, in, in America, 54.4% of people lived in rural. By 2010, that had changed to less than 20%. So we've had this huge, you know, sort of trend towards urbanization. Now we had, we were asked a question today, do you think this is just, a, you know, we talked about the fact, is that just a trend and will it ever go back the other way? I don't know, many plausible futures, right? Many plausible outcomes. It's hard to say at this point. But we do know with these population changes, it changes a lot of things about where you live. It changes a lot of things about communities. 
not just urban, but also rural, right? We've seen hospitals close in the rural sector, and there are many factors associated with this. A lot of it is based on business models that are no longer relevant, but it's also based on that loss of population, right? You need patients if you're going to be a successful hospital. At least that's the way it has been, not necessarily the way it'll be. The ones that have reopened are in the green, so there have been two reopens, but also the healthcare system has changed, right? There's a lot of ownership changes, a lot of more of the corporate world, not just owned locally anymore. And then, of course, one of the big questions that we pursue is the Rural Futures Institute. Why should anybody care about rural? You know, why did you come today? Why should anybody not living in rural care about rural? What does that really need to look like? And I think this is one of the, the quotes um, that kind of hits the point home. Rural America is important to all Americans because it is a primary source for inexpensive and safe food, affordable energy, clean drinking water, and accessible outdoor recreation. There are definitely benefits to rural, not just for the people living there, but to our urban centers as well, and vice versa. This is where urban and rural, I think, have great opportunities to collaborate. Our rural areas are home to our pollinators, right? And we need pollinators. But what do we see happening in pollinator populations? Yes, you did it. Right, we're seeing that, right? And so we need to figure out why, and we need to figure out what we can do differently um, to make sure that our pollinator populations continue to grow and thrive. I've heard from a graduate student, not Jill, <laughs> physical graduate student at the University of Nebraska, that um, actually they're hand pollinating apples in China. Could you imagine what if we had to do that here, what our food supply would look like? You know, how that would change things. I know, you're, you're thinking, why would a, a person from Nebraska talk about elephants, right? But this is also rural. You know, sometimes I think we think about Nebraska or the Midwest, but rural exists throughout our country and throughout our world. And one of the big elephant studies ever done found a more dramatic decline in, decline in elephant populations than they ever thought possible, right? And so this was very alarming. And some people, some futurists, really talk about the fact that we're in an age of mass extinction, not just of our large animal populations, but think about those pollinators as well, the ones that are those bees that are kept, but also our native pollinators. So what happens to us as humans? What happens to the planet if these things happen? And a lot of the poaching that goes on is in rural areas because a lot of people are impoverished. It's a way to make money, but this is a global issue. So even zoos and places like America no longer will get elephants, right? And regardless of what you think of zoos, in Omaha, we have a huge zoo. It's a major economic driver for, for that area of our state, actually. What happens in rural influences urban, and our whole globe is impacted by these types of things. So what is the future of rural? That's really the question that we're here to ask, not just because we have some thoughts, but because we want to get thoughts from you all as well and have this robust conversation. We've been asking ourselves this question for a while. You know, what problem are we trying to solve? That's kind of a, a step one type question in many ways. But also, what we had posed to you today for some open discussion and thought is what future do we want to create? And how do we do this together? What does that really need to look like? How do we take that systems integrated approach and do this differently than what it's been done before? We know that future focused leadership is important. You know, we need to infuse that in some of what we're doing. But this whole model, this whole process moving forward has to be sustainable, include elements of humanity as things continue to evolve there and technology. But rural and urban also have to come together in these conversations and in, in these models. We have companies like Microsoft I mentioned earlier, really working to connect our rural areas because in many ways they have been left behind, not just economically, but with technology. And connecting them will be an important part of, of the economy moving forward. But in order to do that, we have to envision almost the impossible in some ways. We have to envision those various futures, the different outcomes. When Google's hot air balloons connect the most rural and underdeveloped areas to universal high-speed internet or micro drones deliver medical supplies after natural disasters, 
we can start to imagine a world where the ultimate resource technology amplifies our imagination to believe anything is possible. And that's the mindset we would like to start out with in our time here together in our discussion period. I really enjoyed learning more about the Friedman School. I think the work here is incredible. I think we've all discovered that. Um, the students, the, the faculty, and just the ideas and the work that's being done and the models that you're using to do it, I think are so rich and, and we're learning so much. But I love this, the Friedman School pursues cutting edge research and education from cell to society. I mean, that's a very holistic view of what needs to happen moving forward. And so it's exciting to be here today and to really share um, with you, but also learn from you as well. Thank you so much, Tim, for you know, your hospitality and all of you who have taken time to meet with us, those of you that have come to this seminar. So appreciate this connection and so looking forward to seeing what plausible futures we get to co-create together. I also want to thank your staff and the team that's helped make all this possible, Jen in particular. She's around. Yes, yes, it's been awesome. Also, Teresa, Caitlin, thank you both. I know it takes a lot to, to make all this happen. We appreciate everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I am, that's, that's where I live. I'll let you kind of guess which one is me. <laughs> and and, and there are my two kids with me. Now, this is where we could totally say, you know, let the force be with you and leave and fly back to Nebraska tomorrow and, you know, hope it all works out here and, and hope it all works out there. But that's not why we're here. That's not the purpose at all. We want to know what your big ideas are. We want to know what's possible. You know, things like the X Prize, for example, where big pots of money are given to come up with ideas. Anyone a Star Trek fan and remember the tricorder? Yes, I see some hands in the back. Thank you. Has been developed. Yes, I know. Prototyped. It has been prototyped. A very exciting time. Um, but, but the X Prize is what has made that possible. So it, it has always made us think, is there a rural X Prize that we can launch? What can we do here to stimulate great thinking, but also really crowdsource that thinking? You know, it, it, it can't just be our little team at the Rural Futures Institute. It has to be crowdsourced. It has to be done differently. We also have a catch up with Chuck on Facebook. We have a podcast. We're always looking for great speakers. We interviewed Tim this morning and he'll be on catch up with Chuck tomorrow. So I love some deep thinkers, people that are wanting to get their maverick selves out there and be heard, please do join us. With that, I'd like to say thank you and open it up for questions. Thank you. I am, okay. always. We have lots of time until 1.15 to have that conversation about what those might look like from what we think about here and what you think about there. So I'm going to just step aside and let that conversation happen. Great. Thank you, Tim. Wonderful. Go to school for it. <laughs> no, seriously, I've taken a lot of professional development in that space. Um, it's always been there, but to learn the, the methodologies behind it and the tools, I mean, I think it's part of that learning and then doing and really practicing. But there's some great information, different programs, for example. But I think, too, it's, it's kind of putting yourself out there a little bit because I'm not going to, you know, um, say it's always easy to be somebody who probably doesn't agree with, with the norm. I'll give an example of, I was invited to submit a journal article um, around rural, the future of rural health care, and it, it probably didn't say, I know it didn't say exactly what the journal was hoping. It took several rounds of, of back and forth to get that published, but I encourage you to, to get some professional development, but also just linking up with other people, like if this is your world, Linking up with other people in that space is incredible because it'll expand your thinking. So if I can give you my card after, I'd love to. Yeah, the, the old maxim of show up um, for conversations. Right. Uh, we, we've, we've had a number of these conversations lately, uh, particularly with students, and um, it's, it's not that magic uh, to get yourself into a leadership role uh, right. in an industry, in a community, and it, it is, revolves heavily around showing up and creating the conversation, being willing to talk with people that maybe don't necessarily see the world like you do, but uh, those relationships really matter. 
Well, I think you're probably, if you're asking that question, already doing it in some form or fashion. And I think being able to do it at that bigger level is great. Um, you know, because of time, we didn't get into a lot of detail on some things. But it's not just imagining those plausible futures. It's also then how do we get there? And that involves organizational shifts in cultures many times. But it also involves individuals. And those beliefs and behaviors happen at the individual level. And, and I'm also a certified professional coach. And so marrying the futuring and the coaching together have really helped. So you don't just come up with a plan. You can actually execute on that plan and pivot when necessary. There's somebody in the middle. Yeah, we get some other. Yes. I've been serving on a task force for the Nebraska Department of Transportation where we've, we've had some, actually our friends from the University of Nebraska at Omaha, uh, we've had a number of very creative people coming around this issue. And so let me touch on two elements of that. One, just in terms of, of creative transportation solutions in more remote areas, the, the whole driverless vehicle notion um, has some real appeal. Uh, because so often the, the transportation, by the way, is from location to hospital, location to grocery store, location to school, location to work. So it, they're pretty definable paths that seems to perhaps hold some opportunity for that as a low cost uh, means of moving people around. Now. The other side, the barriers, we find some wacky uh, uh, regulatory things. I mean, uh, the, the transportation system in this rural county, in Arthur County, Nebraska, a population of about 700, well, they can't cross the, the county line into McPherson County, so they have, you know, population about 2,500. I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, so, we, so we're working with regulators to say, hey, come on. Um, let's, let's be reasonable here because we do have, even with more traditional transportation services, minivans, et cetera, they're willing to do that. Okay, so who pays for the gas and who are, it, there are all those sort of complex issues, but there are folks that are starting to sit down and say, hey, if we're going to have that livable community out here that accommodates not only the young professionals that were actively trying to recruit, but by the way, their parents and grandparents that still live there and who now are in a position where they need a little more sophisticated health care, which means they have to go down the road a ways. Let's, let's figure out how to, how to resolve that. So um, honestly, I've been pretty encouraged by the nature of people that are coming to the table around those issues. You know, driverless vehicles are, of course, a huge you know, point of conversation right now. And we do some really great work. We're a university of of Nebraska-wide institutes, so we work with our Med Center, our urban campus in Omaha, our Lincoln campus, our Kearney campus, which is in the middle of the state, and all of our extension, our non-tenure leading or tenure leading faculty that live with across our state. Um, but we actually have a lab at the Med Center, that it's a brain lab, a brain biology lab, and they are funded by Toyota, and they have one of the simulator vehicles. I got to drive it, I'm like, wow, this is so cool. It did, it's, it's kind of a weird feeling, but they are actually trying to use sensors like your Fitbit, et cetera, then to detect your health. And so thinking about if I'm diabetic and I'm going to go into a diabetic reaction, I shouldn't be driving. Like I shouldn't be getting into that vehicle. And so thinking about it from that mode, um, but all, all the way to pods of health. And so rather than thinking of it as just a, a transportation vehicle, how could I get my vitals read and... How could I just relax or listen to music or be more productive? Because is there a way for these to become pods of health rather than just a car? 
But of course, then along with that, you have a lot of the ethical challenges. You know, there's a lot of data, a lot of personal health data. Who's that going to? Where is it going? Who owns it? Um, can that be used against you? Um, I think you also have issues of freedom a little bit. So, you know, most of us are very used to driving our own vehicles. We drive a long way, and there's not a lot of public transportation. So my commute to work every day is at an hour and 15 on a good day from my, my driveway to, to the university. Um, but most of us are all highway, so there's, there's a lot of coverage. Now, would I rather have a car, you know, that drives me there, and I can be more productive, or would I rather drive myself? I think those are some of the questions. But we do have some grand challenges. I think, like Chuck was saying, that there's a multiple solutions, too. Now, I will say Japan um, actually is testing out driverless vehicles in their rural sector, and we actually did get an email, what's the future of rural Japan one day? So, I mean, people are curious about this and trying different things and, and different solutions. So I think our rural landscapes can be an interesting area to collaborate on some of these questions, and, and they're important issues. Right here. Well, I think this futuring and strategic foresight is part of that, and there are various methodologies like you're describing, but it's really tailored to fit whatever the questions are or the groups are. Um, a lot of the ways we've, we've worked with this is through those partnerships like you're talking about. Like, what does it need to look like moving forward, and how do we use strategic foresight and futuring as a tool, but also as a point of discussion to kind of discover some new solutions? Um, one of the, the big ways, we haven't necessarily incorporated strategic foresight and futuring into it, but we do have or have had a robust competitive awards program. And so we've funded a lot of research and engagement grants and teaching and engagement grants. So how do we do this in a a little bit differently and engage not only our faculty within that, but their networks as well, students, um, nonprofit organizations, other community-based leaders and organizations through that process. So actually really looking at a future that is created by the communities, the students, and the faculty together. You know, I might add on the whole, how do we, how do we foster creativity in rural communities? We, we have a delightful colleague at the University of Nebraska, Dr. Shane Farrader, formerly at MIT, but he is a Ramena, Nebraska boy who's now back in our College of Engineering, who really is on a mission to develop maker spaces in rural communities and using local libraries, using uh, the old shop at the school uh, to create those spaces in rural communities that where, you know, we think of 3D printers, but, you know, laser cutters of various kinds and, and even just art gallery, uh, art studio spaces for creative types to feel that there is a place in my town where I can come and do stuff. And so it's, uh, it's growing in popularity. There's, a, there's an interesting movement actually across the state, and this has been done around the country, uh, but we're, we think Nebraska is a bit of a leader in that space. So anyway, a constant process of trying to encourage that. How do we go from where we are to where we'd like to be? Sure. Um, well, first, thank you for a really hopeful and inspiring uh, talk. It's great to hear. And I'm, I'm a professor here in the, in the society side of that. Great. So, uh, um, my question would be a little bit different it's about politics. And um, before I came here, I spent eight years working with Tom Vilsack. Um, oh, sure. Agriculture, and you, you may or may not know about it, but, you know, he wasn't the president's first choice to be um, secretary. Uh, but he got the job in the interview, and he got it because he uh, basically wanted to be the secretary of rural America. And essentially wanted to make the Department of Agriculture. And he also wanted to solve two problems. One is he just felt that there was so much that, you know, as, as a former governor of Iowa, there was so much that needed to be done to help rural America, from broadband, to trans I mean, just all these issues, health care, and the Department of Agriculture had the resources to do that. 
But I want to focus on the, the second problem he wanted to solve, which was also to make uh, rural America a little more democratic. He realized it wants to be democratic um, overall, but maybe you know um, a, a little bit more. And I, you know, I think that um, the president bought it, um, so he had the president's full backing, and he spent eight years. He was there the entire time. Um, he spent him. You know, he was this tireless guy. He spent all his time and effort, sort of with the belief that if he work to make rural America better and show that people could do that as a Democrat, there could be some movement at all towards a Democratic Party. And I, I, I think if you got him on an honest day, he couldn't be more proud about what we accomplished, but couldn't be more discouraged that he couldn't meet actually as a result. So, and, and, and so, um, you know, and he would talk to people about that. He would talk to people about it in the election cycle, saying, you know, if you vote um, um, for who's now president, you know, trade, immigration, all these things are going to of the rural economy, and they said we know, and, and but we just can't do something. Um, and, and so I, I wonder if you could reflect on that in, in terms of uh, the, the positive, hopeful tone of your work, but what seems to be a, a very sort of fear driven negative. Um, Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, okay, yeah. interest of full I mean, I'm an old Bob Kerry. Uh, actually, I was a Republican appointee in, in his administration as governor. And uh, uh, so, and then I have consistently missed every election since that time in terms of my selections. So, um, I, 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 I'm probably not a good analyst, but I have thought and worried about it. Because I, I'd honestly, it, it doesn't make rational sense that rural people vote the way they do in many cases, and particularly agricultural people. So it's sort of a, it is a, it is a sort of a cultural thing, but here's what makes me hopeful. I spend um, a good bit of time with students. We don't, we are not a teaching function of the university, but we have the opportunity to engage with students who either come to us or are sent to us to, to job shadow or to just to come talk about what might my, my life look like. And I'll tell you, as I meet with these really high ambition, high achieving students who uh, obviously have a rural interest or they wouldn't be coming and talking to us. And in fact they are and they are very interested in going and starting businesses, building families, et cetera, in rural communities. And there, what encourages me is the number of them who say part of my life plan is public service. In, in some cases, I'm gonna, I want to run for office, I want to I want to be a direct player, but um, even at slightly lower levels of ambition, I want to be in a community where I can be involved in leadership in the community where my values, my notion of community uh, will make a difference. And I'll tell you, and these, these kids really believe in the, the fundamental principles, uh, the idealistic principles of our nation in a way that, and, and I suppose every generation that's come along, you, you could take some subset of them and say, well, yeah, well, that's what they are. It, it encourages me with the number of them that are that look at the way we're functioning today, so polarized, when it would be so easy to say, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hide somewhere and I can't deal with this and I don't like all that, who are instead saying, no, I'm going to, I'm going to engage and try to make more practical sense of this, return some civility to our discourse around political issues, and that to me is encouraging. Now, and I will also say the number of them that are not, that are registered independents and are and are sort of saying, I can't, I, I'm not, it's not making sense to me on either side of this divide. I want to rethink the way politics work. Make me encouraged. It's not a great answer, but it's 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 the way I'm I'm kind of seeing the world today, and it's it's what I'm relying on <laughs> to have a more livable future. Yeah. I guess personally, I would say I don't think any politician should try to lobby for where people should land on the political spectrum. I think that you know part of um, what we cherish in the United States is our freedom to choose and decide for ourselves. Um, and I, I don't know if anyone's here is military active or 
or no, no longer? Yeah, well, a, you know, a great deal of our military um, come from rural areas, you know, and I can't remember the exact percentage, but. Um, it was one of Vilsack's messages. It, it was. Yeah, he, it he, was. I heard him yeah. speak, and he talked a lot yeah. about that. And I, I think that, you know, you know, I had a, I have a great uncle that um, served in World War II. I have a lot of relatives that have served in that space. I, I think to preserve that freedom to vote however you want to vote is incredibly important. And the fact that we can go do that is, is part of what makes our country so amazing. I will also say that, you know, we did have a good laugh after <laughs> the election. Um, not because who, you know, how the election played out, but because of the stereotypes that came out after that election. So just in our office alone, um, everybody in, in our our little team lives in a rural community. Um, but I would have to say we all defy the stereotypes that came out as well. We all um, have our college graduates, many of us with advanced degrees. Um, not, none of us, there wasn't like everybody voted for this person or everybody voted for that person. You know, and a lot of our families are from those, those rural communities that were so talked about in the media. Um, and a lot of the people in those communities were divided on their votes as well. Um, and I think that's an important point that often gets missed. I think what got missed in the election is that a lot of our polling organizations haven't listened. They, they've been polling the same people for so long they forgot there was anybody else out there. And so I think for us to lend a voice to rural, um, which, is, which is part of our mission and work at the Rural Futures Institute, is very important. But I think it's also realizing that this is an urban-rural issue, and everybody's voice is important, and everybody's voice needs to be heard. And, and that might be an election. So for me personally, um, I was a registered Democrat until we had the first caucus in Nebraska, um, which was a complete disaster. And uh, it just was. We had never done it before. And now I'm a registered independent, because I just prefer to vote the way I want to vote on anything and anybody. Um, and I think we see a lot more of that happening because people are frustrated, honestly, with both parties. Right. Well, I think, you know, we'd need to dive into that a little bit more, I think. But I think this is part of why we're, we're taking on this conversation and, and really partnering with places like Tufts, right? What are some opportunities and solutions in this space? And knowing that it can't just be about a strategic plan, but it has to be about the people that are living there, right? And, and that are, are welcoming there. In fact, we had some of this conversation this morning, right? It's not perfect anywhere, whether it's rural or urban. And there are differences and challenges between each locality, wherever you go. But how do we bring it together and really work with the community in some healing? Sometimes that needs to happen, but also finding the opportunities that exist where it's a win-win. Tim and I talked about this this morning in our podcast interview. Getting different stakeholders to the table, oftentimes we're missing some very important voices. But creating a, a, a grand sort of scenario for everybody not just one or two players who are going to win and, and somebody else that's going to lose.
but rather co-create that future together? And I know that's a simplistic answer to a, a challenging question, but I think we could explore that in more detail with you. Sure. It's, uh, and what happens is this. Let me, let me touch two points that you've made. One around the tourism deal and the, uh, you know, it's, it's so tempting to say, okay, so you smart guys up here, you figure out how we, how we fix that. Where I see it actually being fixed are folks, uh, Stan, I can't say his last name, at Grable, Wyoming, who, uh, a rancher who, uh, with the reintroduction of the wolves. Now you talk about a, a divisive situation culturally in many other ways. Stan, instead of just taking up arms and saying, I'll just shoot anybody that, instead invites uh, over decades um, leaders from the Audubon Society, from uh, Nature Conservancy, you name it, and came out and built a dialogue in the little community of Grable, Wyoming, around here's why we as ranchers are concerned about this, but by the way, we, we also accept, there's maybe some, good, anyway, it created a very productive dialogue. Uh, here's a guy who uh, hadn't gone to Tufts to learn how to, how to cross all these barriers, but did one of the most beautiful jobs of diplomacy, Calamus Outfitters uh, in Nebraska, that uh, bring actually people from all kinds of urban areas now out to the sand hills of Nebraska to, to float in water tanks down the Calamus River. Uh, they have done a remarkable job, and by the way, a profitable job of bringing people not like them uh, into their community. Again, is it is it still, there's a still a certain amount of this? Yeah, but you know, it's when people get to know each other on a personal basis that you start crossing those barriers and building smoother waters going out. On the, on the school side, you know, I mean, when I left the ranch in 1983, my dad gave me two pieces of advice. Number one, remember that two and two must always come out four, and number two, don't be stupid. Um, and I've tried to follow that. So when we think about school consolidation, it's two and two has to come out four in being able to deliver education to those students. Now. Once we say that, however, we see relatively small communities that are saying, okay, we're not okay, which is saying, okay, we're gonna shrink the education opportunity for our kids just because we live in a rural area. They are taking advantage of connectivity. They are taking advantage of some very creative notions of bringing education resources to their community. And I mean, at COZAD, Nebraska, there's a young woman taking cello lessons from Juilliard. Um, it just, and, but it, it doesn't just happen. Again, it's all about people in leadership roles saying, yeah, but let's, let's rethink this. And so creativity becomes, uh, becomes an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is great fun. I can't, can't let this opportunity go by without embarrassing my dear friend Teresa. So she <laughs> For sure. introduced us last year, but... Teresa and I have essentially been having an urban and rural conversation since 1981. Oh, I love it. <laughs> so we That's great. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. so, uh, if you would like that lunch with uh, the crew from RFI, we're going to be up in 272. I will take you guys up there. Great, thank you. So thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you, sir.